PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X are on deck to be released within the next month. In a previous video, I talked about the differences between the two and how homogenized game hardware architecture has become. However, I'm going to talk today specifically about the PlayStation 5 SSD. As I covered in the previous video, the SSD is where all the custom R&D had gone into in the past few years before this next-gen launch in both the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. And Sony made a bold claim back in March that the PS5's SSD will completely change next generation level design. It's not every day that a multinational conglomerate like Sony Corporation makes a statement that bold. Let's figure out why they did. Hi everybody, I'm James from Zygle Studios, and today we're going to look at what's inside the PlayStation 5's custom SSD. Let's talk about the five main things that the PlayStation 5's SSD was designed around. A one second boot time, no load screens, ultra high speed data streaming, deduplicating game data, and no long patch installs. These five tenants guided the PlayStation 5's SSD design, and let's take a look at what that entails of. The PlayStation 5 SSD's claim for how fast it can move data is at 5.5 gigabytes per second. That's immense. Essentially what that means is in a quarter of a second, you're pushing two gigabytes of data around. This means potentially that you don't even need a load screen at all. Within a few seconds, you can easily pack in 10 gigabytes worth of data into where the system needs it most. This is so fast that developers may even need to slow down the game perspective from how fast the data gets loaded just so the player doesn't get disoriented. What's the secret to this speed? This is where the interesting part comes in. Let's start with the flash memory chips themselves. There's actually six Toshiba BICS 3D flash memory chip. That specific chip has three discrete sizes, 128 gigs, 256 gigs, 512 gigs. These six chips by themselves mean virtually nothing as they have their own protocols in order to store and read data. But the secret to it all is the 12 channel DMA memory controller. And this SSD controller is pretty awesome. In an attempt to optimize spatial and temporal locality, Sony made the bold move of unifying the memory architecture with the SSD architecture. Not only have they kept non-volatile memory and memory close together on the board, but they've also kept the CPU close as well. This means that the access latency times would be less, and also, keeping the data close to each other makes it easier to access. And this provides the lower level of 5.5 gigabytes per second, raw. This isn't even compressed. There's even some reports rolling in that 17 gigs a second is also possible. The PS5 has 16 gigabytes of DDR6 unified RAM, and the bandwidth here is 448 gigabytes a second. This memory is directly tied with the SSD, and at this point you can immensely boost the RAM efficiency. The 12 channel controller that's hooked up to the 6 flash chips is tied with RAM on the die. So not only are you able to access things and transfer things from the SSD to RAM extremely quickly, it's also cheaper as well and you can consolidate the amount of RAM you actually need. The real power of this design, though, comes with the custom I.O. unit. Not only are there custom cache scrubbers and a dedicated DMA controller that owns 12 channels across all 6 chips, but there's also two I.O. coprocessors to help improve throughput and on-chip RAM as well. With this on-chip RAM, you have such great spatial locality that essentially RAM access is pretty much instant in this controller. And there's also something called a coherency engine, which basically oversees the operations of this custom chip. But the fun and most clever part is probably this whole hardware-based compression business. So for those of you who don't know what compression is, compression is, in the simplest terms, a way of representing data in a smaller form of size, with minimizing the amount of information loss or not have any at all. The foundations of compression began in the 40s when Claude Shannon posted his Mathematical Theory for Communication paper this foundational paper was able to relate signals to information. This essentially allowed electrical signals to be represented as pieces of data, and also to be able to symbolically represent data as information. And yes, there is a difference. Data is just a set of numbers or symbols that could potentially mean anything, whereas information can be inferred from the data based on a specific alphabet, in the case of information theory, or just a message. So for example, a collection of letters could be data, but maybe that data says, hello, I'm James. The information taken out of that message would be a salutations and also that my name is James. But the data could just be the letters. Here's the use case for compression. Imagine you have a very small amount of storage, but you have a decent size amount of data. You analyze the data and you realize a lot of it is redundant, meaning that there's multiple symbols of the same thing inside the entire data structure. 
there's a way to consolidate that data and represent it differently in order to save space, but essentially mean the same thing. And this is the foundations of compression. There are two types of compression. There's lossy and lossless. Like I said before, the idea of compression is to essentially take a blob of data and preserve its information before and after compression. So if we have a blob of data we want to make smaller, we want to make sure that when we decode the data or reinterpret it after we need it again, that it means the same exact thing as we had before or roughly the same thing as before so that there's no difference to the performance of whatever it's trying to do. Lossy compression essentially loses a little bit of information upon compression and decompression, and over time, this information can erode and cause problems. The MPEG standard, especially MP3, you can really notice the difference in audio quality as things have been compressed and recompressed all over again. The more times you do it, the less information you'll have at the end. Whereas lossless, like something like FLAC, following the audio trend, you'll always have all the original information inside of that file because it's a lossless compression algorithm. There has been no information lost from start to finish no matter how many times you do it. But here's the thing, lossy versus lossless is a pretty big deal. There's a big design trade-off. Lossless data files are typically much larger because all the information is there, whereas lossy are much smaller but retain a little bit less information. And the great thing is with lossy compression, as long as you calculate how much information on average you're gonna lose based on your data, it only needs to happen once, so you're not going to lose any more than that initial one unless you re-crunch and recompress the data again, which is not recommended. So here's where the PS5's hardware comes in. There's something called the crack and decompressor, and the largest benefit you get from this is it's both not only lossless, but it gets a super fast decode speed with a high compression ratio. This seems like the holy grail. Typically lossless has a much smaller compression ratio, and it takes a long time to decode. So how is this achieved? Simply because it's a special hardware peripheral to do it. And when this is integrated into the hardware architecture itself and the whole system can run off of it, you get some pretty astounding results. That's why you're looking at almost a two times speed up in terms of SSD throughput. Here's how complicated the algorithm is. Without a dedicated IC to do this compression, it would take nine Zen 2 CPU cores to decompress that type of data. You can get closer to 10 gigabytes per second rather than five and a half. That's pretty amazing. Something I really like about this system are the coherency engines, and the coherency engines essentially work directly with the CPU and the GPU to optimize certain portions of the cache to send data over and have a higher rate of hits in the cache or hot data in the cache. And it uses its own proprietary techniques in order to, well, clean the cache, or in this case they call it scrubbing, and then reload hot data in there. This system is really well designed and quite awesome and I'm really excited to see what it can do. I hope you all enjoyed this video on the PS5's custom SSD and hardware architecture. Next time, I will cover the Xbox Series X custom NVMe SSD, as well as how that's designed too. I hope you all enjoyed, and stay tuned for the next one. This is James from Zygol Studios, signing off.